The most important thing is you, can, you must align your vision with the self of your future fulfilled. We cannot receive into our lives that which is inconsistent with our identity to have. We absolutely can't. So about 25 years ago, I was a graduate student. I was getting my master's degree in clinical psychology. And I was incredibly shy. I was shy in the way where it made it hard to look people directly in the eyes. And at the time, I was kind of a starving student. I was living hand to mouth. I had had a modestly successful career as a singer, and I think the word successful, I'm using it in the most generous term of the word. I had founded or co-founded a nonprofit organization that was doing work with the homeless. But I was still struggling, I was still trying to find myself, really. And in the midst of this, I started to feel intuitively that somewhere in the future, that I was going to be speaking to thousands of people. Now, this didn't make any sense to me at all. The gap was so severe, I was actually confused by that kind of premonition. So I called my mom. And I said, Mom, I think I'm going to be speaking to thousands of people. And this is when I learned the lesson that if life is giving you the seeds of a vision and they're emerging in the depths of your being, you probably don't want to call your family and tell them about it. <laughs> because my mom said to me, well, what the hell are you going to be talking about? Because <laughs> we're from New York. And I didn't know how to answer that question. I, I certainly had no level of mastery over any area of my life. I was still kind of struggling and, you know, and trying to figure it out. And I certainly never dreamed that I'd be speaking about love because that part of my life was just a disaster. And yet I kept having this feeling that I was going to be a teacher. And I would elevate and educate and inspire people. The one thing that I did know about this is that if this was the future that was possible for me, that I should probably become a person who actually had something valuable to say. And that I should probably focusing, focus on becoming a person who was trustworthy with that kind of power, the power to influence people. And that I should certainly become the kind of person who could actually look people in the eyes when I spoke to them. And so this kind of became my North Star, this, this possible future that I had no particulars about what that might even look like. And I began to hold myself accountable for being who I might need to be in order to fulfill upon that future. And so I up-leveled my game. And I started to really take my spiritual path much more seriously. And I started to take my psychological development much more seriously. I started to hold myself accountable and measure all of my actions and my choices against this possible future. I forgave people, I chose the high road, I made amends wherever I could, I began to keep my word, I began to study more diligently, and all inside of becoming the person I might need to be to one day stand in front of thousands of people and have the opportunity to speak. And I even worked with my physicality. So I would be walking down the street in the morning and I'd think to myself, well, how would a world leader of love and light walk down the street? And I'd stand a little taller, and I'd walk a little, you know, more straight up, and, and then I'd walk into the local Starbucks, and I'd ask myself, well, how would a world leader order her morning coffee? And I'd look the barista straight in the eye, and I'd say, I'll take a tall Americano, please, in this very noble way. 
And see, it was that future that actually began to give who I was being in the present. And I just wanted to tell you that because I'm having a moment right now. Because between us right here and all of our friends on the live stream, I am indeed experiencing the fulfillment of that possible future that I've been working for for so many years. And I am indeed, ah, thank you. Yay! Yay! (laughs) And I am indeed here to talk to you about love. So, whether you are in a place where you yourself want to call in the one, or I saw a lot of you raise your hands that you're in a relationship, so whether you want to elevate the connection that you have with the one, or whether you're just with someone and you don't really know if it's the one, or if you have something else entirely on your mind today, You're standing for a miracle in your health. You're standing for a breakthrough in finances. You're standing for causing something of beauty in the world. And there's a gap right now between your experience of life and where you feel called to go. I just want to invite you to put that at stake in this conversation and to bring it here and to apply what I'm saying to your circumstance. So my own miracle in love began um, 20 years ago, really maybe 20 years and six months ago, to be exact. And um, it started with where all miracles start, which is that I had no chance in hell of this ever happening. And I was 41 at the time, and I had never been married, and this was a, a source of great disappointment to me because I had longed for a partner, I longed for a family, I wanted to have a child. And so I was kind of adjusting myself and trying to make the best of it, but I felt very disappointed. And I was fortunate enough at the time to be a part of this circle of people who were uh, setting intentions and holding those intentions with and for each other. Now, because this is 20 years ago, we actually didn't know the research on it because the research came later. But I want to tell you that Princeton University has come out with a study that when bonded groups of people are holding an intention together, that it's six times more likely to happen than if you're just holding it on your own. So I just validated you taking all this time to come and be with your friends at Mind Valley and sharing your visions and your intentions with each other. So this is what we were doing in this group. And mostly people were focused on... um, They wanted to double their income, or they wanted to buy a house, and they were manifesting these things. But I wanted to call in love. So I called a friend from this group, and I was kind of fueled because I was coming off yet another failed love affair. I had had, it wasn't like no one was showing up in my life. I had, you know, relationship after relationship after relationship, but unfortunately, there were always impossible relationships. I had a pattern of attracting in unavailable people. So like married men, engaged men, commitment phobic men, alcoholic men, workaholic men, gay men who wanted to explore had a thing for me. So I'd had just yet another disappointing love affair, and I called up my friend Naomi. And I said, Naomi, I'm, I'm going to set an outrageous intention. I'm going to be engaged by my 42nd birthday. That was eight months out. I had no possibility for a partner in my life. And she said something that really changed my life. She said, Catherine, I'm going to hold that intention with you and for you. If you give me permission to hold you accountable to being the woman that you would need to be to have that happen. And in that moment, my whole worldview just shifted. Because rather than, you know, running out frantically to try and find love to meet that deadline, I turned my whole attention towards myself to identify and release any hidden internal barriers that I had not been aware of until that point. I took full responsibility 
for myself as the source of my experience. And once I shifted my attention towards seeing myself as source, all sorts of things began to be revealed. Every morning I would sit on my meditation cushion and I would imagine that future as though it were already happening now. And I'd put it into my body. What does it feel like to have that person's hand on the small of my back? What does it sound like when he's singing in the shower or talking on the phone in the next room? What does it smell like when he brings roses to me or when he's cooking dinner for me? And I would just imagine, and because I wanted to have a baby, I imagined like, what might it feel like to have a bowling ball in your belly and you're waddling through the kitchen? So I began to, to, to imagine this and then I would ask myself three critical questions. I would ask myself, Catherine, what would you need to let go of in order to make room for this vision to come to you? What would you need to release from your life? A relationship, an old habit, a belief, toxic dynamics, what would I have to let go of? The second question, how would you need to grow yourself and develop yourself in order to be ready when this relationship comes to you? How will I need to communicate? How will I need to handle my own big emotions so that I stop being so hot-tempered? How do I pace relationships so that I can build trust rather than just assume trust and then get myself all disappointed? And then the third question is, what's my next step? And so I'd go immediately into action. And you know, I find that when we ask the universe these questions, a lot of clarity emerges. You have to ask the question first, but if you ask life, what's my next step to get to that future, which looks impossible from this perspective, you will start to intuitively know what that next step is. So I wasn't having burning bush experiences. I would get up from my meditation cushion and I'd suddenly notice for the very first time that in my apartment there were only pictures of single women nobly staring off into space. <laughs> so I took the girls down and I put them in the closet. I put up new pictures that represented community and love and relationship and togetherness. I started to, one day I just got inspired to clean out my closet so that he would have a place to put his things. I noticed that I had my bed, which was a double bed, but I had it pushed up against the wall so that you could only get into it from one side. So I feng shui the bedroom. I turned the bed catter corner. I put two night tables there. But really what started to happen was actually deeper. Like, I started to see all of the inconsistencies within me. I started to inquire into, well, what are the parts of me that don't actually want a relationship? Well, I actually really discovered that I love my freedom. And I didn't really want to be dominated by someone else's agenda or their needs. I also saw that I had a belief in this either-or kind of universe where either I got to have a mission-oriented career, I got to be a creative person, a force of nature in this universe, or I got to be in a relationship. See, but once I made it conscious, then I could say to myself, okay, well, that's option A and option B. What about option C? Like, what would it look like to actually have a relationship where you can become more than you are because you're so loved and you're so supported and you have someone in your corner who's always rooting for you? It was like a new concept. But I also began to see all the ways that my past was in my present and preventing me from actually manifesting that future. I saw the ways that I was still holding on to resentment, where I was still victimized by things that had happened to me. God bless you, God bless you. Where I was still victimized by like past boyfriends. I mentioned that I had a nonprofit and uh, I had a big resentment at this time towards my, my, my uh, co-partner, which we had dissolved the organization. 
and I had a lot of anger towards him about how that happened because originally it was my idea and my vision. It was quite a beautiful vision, what we were doing. We were actually bringing songwriters down to Skid Row to co-write music about people's transformation. And then we were supporting them to rejoin the community by giving them the sense of belonging. It was really quite lovely. And it became a thing in the LA music community. We had like a thousand musicians participate. It lasted for five years. It was a big deal. It was beautiful. We had star artists recording the songs. And, but when I left, you know, he was kind of my half in, half out boyfriend. So we had a lot of turmoil. And when we ended our relationship, my worst fear happened. And he kept the organization and then he did nothing with it, so it died. So I was seething about this. Now, I knew I didn't want to bring this into my next relationship, but inside of giving up victimization, inside of this commitment, I actually asked myself for the really the first time, Catherine, what was your part in that? And again, when you ask, all the answers come. And I suddenly saw that really when I was given that vision in the beginning, I didn't actually believe in myself. And so I didn't know him very well at the time. We went out to dinner. I told him about the vision. I really wanted to just suss out whether he thought it was a viable thing to do. He loved the vision. And I just made him a full-on partner, 50% right off the bat. I didn't keep the 51%. I just gave it away because I didn't believe in myself. And that was a turning point in my life because for years I'd been giving things away and devaluing myself and not believing in my own creativity. And when I finally took responsibility, I saw it was actually all me. I'd given away my power to him constantly. And I discovered in that moment that we only resent people to the extent that we give our power away to them. And I forgave myself by making a vow to never ever devalue my contribution again. And that changed my life for the better. Today, he's a very good friend of mine. The other thing I looked at is old agreements that were anchoring me in the past. You know, old agreements are the kind of unspoken, almost unconscious agreements that we make, like my sister's the pretty one, I'll just be the smart one. Or I don't want to be happier in love than my mother was because my mother you know, deserves to have company in her misery. The agreement that I saw was to an old boyfriend who I had broken up with over 20 years before that. He was my high school boyfriend, Frank, and we, uh, we were very in love all through high school, and we even had names picked out for our kids. We were in for the long haul. But when I graduated high school, it just became clear we had two different paths to go. I wanted to go to college. He didn't. He wanted to go into the business of his family. So we part ways in this very dramatic way, and it was, you know, terribly Shakespearean in my heart. And I couldn't bear the thought of never being with him again, so I, I made a pledge to him. I said, I'll tell you what, we'll go our separate ways now, but when we're in our 60s, we'll come back together again, and then we'll get married which made sense to me when I was 18. But it obviously didn't register for him because he went out and just got married the next year and then had three children and a very successful life. But, you know, I dreamt about him for 20 years. And I realized, wow, there's a part of me still hoping, still holding out that maybe one day, and I'm keeping myself single because I'm thinking maybe one day it will happen. I also noticed the toxic relational dynamics that had been habitual, which very often happens in family relationships. So all of these things, you know, that needed to get up-leveled and cleared up, and I needed to start telling the truth, and I needed to start setting boundaries. I basically needed to start showing up consistently in a way that was consistent with the future that I was committed to creating and have my loyalty there. But the biggest block to love was that my own sense of self was incongruent with that future fulfilled. You see, when I was a child, I was born to a teenage mother. My parents got married because they had to. It was back in the 50s. But they didn't like each other very much. 
So they fought a lot. And they fought so much that they ended up having this very antagonistic, hostile separation. And so my father left. Eventually I lost connection with him entirely, even though he was kind of the love of my life. And my mother was young and in college, and so, and it was back before people knew any better, so she would leave me home in an empty apartment at night when she went out partying with her friends, because they thought it was okay to do that back then. And then I was a latchkey kid, which basically meant that for years I came home after school and I was alone in the house. I was the, an only child. So I had formed this deep sense of myself as fundamentally alone in this world that no one would ever really be there for me, that I would never really get my needs met by anybody. And inside of, now I think a lot of us know these kind of core wounds and the meaning that we make and then the mishigash that it kind of creates in our lives. But what was different about this time, because I'm, I'm owning myself as the source, I asked myself, how am I the source of keeping this story alive? How is it that I have managed to stay on my own for all of these years. So in other words, I wouldn't even be victimized by my own consciousness. I wanted to know how it was actually happening through me and not just to me. And inside of that inquiry, I started to see very clearly, well, number one, that I would get involved with people who would predictably not be able to be there for me because they were committed elsewhere. Number two, that I had lowered my expectations so much that I didn't even bring my deeper feelings and needs to the relationship. I would just be the one who gave all the time in a way that was kind of a safer position because it was the power position. I'd never really have to experience the disappointment of people not being there for me. I perfected the art of self-sufficiency. I rarely asked for support. I didn't let people into my inner world. And so when I saw that clearly, I asked myself, sweetheart, what's actually true about this story that you're all alone and no one will ever be there for you and everyone will always leave? And I realized it wasn't even true. It was a myth that I had made up as a child and was living into that story and perpetuating that story and how I was showing up over and over and over again. And so I woke myself up out of this story. And I asked myself, what is more true than that story? And what I came to is that I came here to love and be loved. And I have the power to learn how to have rich, deep connections with others that grow over time. And then I asked myself, and how will I be showing up to create that? And I started to take the risk to show up in ways that felt completely outside of who I've known myself to be. I would be vulnerable. I would be transparent. I started to actively take on breaking up that structure. I started to take on projects that were bigger than me that I would have to work with other people and have to become reliant upon people, interdependent with people. And I started living into that future at the level of identity. And that was the biggest shift. Because the moment I started to do that, guess what? People actually started to be there for me at a whole different level. People started telling me, I am so relieved that you're finally opening up to us, that we finally get to be there for you. And that just rocked my world because it wasn't how I knew it to be. So every insight that I had went into an action immediately. How can I put this to good use? How can I show up differently? What can I do to generate life from the future backwards? In several weeks into this process, I called up a friend from my group and I said, I'm really getting impatient because it's the end of March. My birthday's August. He's not here yet. She said, why don't you go online, Catherine? Now, that's a normal thing now. 20 years ago, that was not a normal thing. 20 years ago, people didn't even have their pictures up online, if you can even imagine such a time. 20 years ago, it was still like one step above the personal ads in the newspaper, you know, like a lonely hearts club kind of feeling. But I did it, I did because I was coachable. I went online. 
there was only really one dating site, but it had a quarter of a million people. It doesn't even exist anymore. It had a quarter of a million people. And I start reading through the profiles, and I ended up responding to only one person, completely anonymously. You know, back then they had handles, you know, like no names or any identifying characteristics, no pictures, but, you know, two hearts beating is one. It was like the handle. So I responded in awkward, e a little email, and then, and then that was it for me. That was as much as I could tolerate. And the next day, when I woke up, this gentleman had written me back, and it went straight into my email box, and his name was in parentheses. And it was the man I had dated six years earlier, who for years I had thought of as the one that got away. And we went out on a coffee date, and within a matter of hours, I knew he was the one I was calling in. We got married the next year. I gave birth to our daughter. And, and at that point, I thought, okay, this can't just be a personal miracle. So I went back, and I started to try and decipher what I had done. And I saw that I started with a really big, bold intention. And that I followed it with com taking complete responsibility for myself as the source of my experience. And the third thing that I did is that I aligned my identity with my future self and began living from that sense of self. And the fourth thing is that I saw myself as a co-creator of this process. I wasn't just passively praying for love or hoping for love or waiting for it to happen. I started to show up in a way that was aligned with my intuitive knowing, that was breaking up the old patterns and that was giving me optimal opportunity to manifest that miracle. So I wrote a book about it, and that became Calling in the One. I had no platform at the time. I was kind of a newbie psychotherapist. I took seven years to get licensed, and I had just gotten my license. And um, I wrote a book, and within four months, it became a national bestseller. So here I have the great husband, I have the baby, I have the national best-selling book, we bought our dream house, thousands of people started coming to me to teach them how to manifest love. I was kind of living happily ever after to the hilt. I had it down. And then, of course, a decade in, we decided to get unmarried. So I had a little PR problem on my hands. <laughs> and I didn't know if I was going to be able to come back from it. But I wasn't willing to stay married for PR reasons. I needed to live an authentic life. And so I trusted the process. And Mark and I decided to get unmarried, not because anything was so horrible in our marriage, but because we'd really grown apart. And we felt that what was really strongest between us was co-parenting our daughter. Now, I'll tell you, when we first decided this, I was terrified it was going to be like past breakups, because I have had some very bad breakups. You know, we had Frank, who I dreamt about for 20 years. I had another breakup in there while I started smoking again. I didn't eat or sleep for a year, half the hair on my head fell out. It was very, very traumatic. So I was afraid of that happening. But the biggest fear I had was that my daughter was going to be damaged, because we all know that divorce damages children, and certainly my parents divorced did a lot of crazy stuff to me. And I saw, you know, Mark also had had parental alienation. His parents got divorced. So we were, we were, we were very sensitive to this. And, um, and the other thing I noticed at this time is that I did feel... I mean, socially embarrassed, double so because of calling in the one. But I also felt a shame that I knew a lot of other people feel at the end of a breakup. And so one day I was just sitting with this sense of shame. And what I know about shame is, you know, guilt is when we violate our own internal rules. But shame is when we violate the rules of our culture. When we're not sh being who we're supposed to be in this life. And so I thought about it. You know, and I, and, I, and I wondered, whose standards am I holding myself accountable to? 
And that's when I realized that we're all kind of inside of the happily ever after myth. So I got curious about that, and I went to research that. Like, who made this story up anyway? Because we have it like God made the mountains, God made the sun, and God made happily ever after. And what I discovered is that it's a 400-year-old myth that started not far from here in Venice, Italy, when the life conditions were exceptionally different than they are today. First of all, the lifespan was less than 40 years of age. There was certainly no mobility where people were moving around. There was very little choice. Half the children were struggling with illness to the point where only half of them would become 16. The rest would die. You know, in that world, okay, probably smart to keep the parents together. And you also notice in Happily Ever After that there is this expectation of upward mobility. Because all of Happily Ever After, you know, is about a pauper, a commoner, marrying a noble person. Well, did you know in Venice, Italy, 400 years ago, that there was actually a law on the books that would prevent such a marriage. So that if you were born in poverty, you were most certainly going to die in poverty. So we have to realize that these cultural constructs come out of the life conditions of the day. And when I thought about it like that, I realized, well, the life conditions of our time is serial monogamy. I'm not promoting serial monogamy, But most of us are slated to have two or three very significant relationships in our lifetime. Those are the statistics. So I thought, well, we're up-leveling our exercise programs and our diets and our educational practices. Shouldn't we maybe consider up-leveling our separation practices? You know, even though I'm pro-marriage, I'm not pro-misery. And I'm certainly not pro-hostile divorce because I know what that does to children. So Mark and I got together and we decided that we were going to align upon the possibility that our daughter could have a happy childhood and that we could actually create a happy even after family and a post-divorce family that was cohesive and kind and contained where she wouldn't have to choose sides or she wouldn't have to deal with the festering resentments. Now, there was some inner work that we had to do in order to do that. And the inner work was that we had to manage our emotions, you know, because there's almost a biological component when we're breaking up with people. Psychologists call it a rupture of attachment. It can be a very traumatic thing. And most of us know that we can behave uncharacteristically bad at the end of love and do things that we later regret terribly. Or we see that other people have done that to us. The Japanese have a saying that says, you don't know your wife until you divorce her. So I created these steps that allowed us to do this well, that would allow us to live in alignment with our ethics as opposed to our overwhelming emotions so that we could show up in integrity with who we actually are and even a positive future happening not just for ourselves but for everyone involved so finding emotional freedom learning how to manage those emotions and actually take the negative energy and transform them into good or Reclaiming our power in our life, which is really about noticing the the deep, dark resentments that we hold on to. And let me just tell you something. If you are a person who's struggling with resentment, it's, it's probably because somebody behaved badly. See, we just have to validate the hurt that we've experienced relationally. It happened. You know, it did happen. It was a violation So we don't want to skip over that, but we don't want to be dominated by it. So I like to say, even if someone was 97% wrong, you want to look at your 3%, because that's what you can get your life from. Because you look at that 3%, you say, okay, even though, you know, that person was a narcissist and they were malignant and they did all this stuff to me, The truth is, is that I was giving my power away to that person. 
I was pretending to be less than who I am. I was ignoring my own deeper knowing. I was dismissing my feelings and needs in service to taking care of the perceived feelings and needs of someone else. See, once you start to look at your 3%, that's a very consuming place to be putting your attention. We have a lot of work to do on ourselves on that 3%. So, you know, forgiveness is an organic process when you really wake up to yourself as the co-creator of a dynamic and you make an amends to yourself. You promise yourself that from this moment forward, I will always live in integrity with the truth of who I am. I will always honor my deeper knowing and take responsibility for myself. I will always negotiate for my needs. I will always take responsibility for presencing myself. Right? So you can get your life out of that moment. And know that your whole life is going to change, not just in intimate love, but everywhere, because you've been doing it everywhere. There's also the insult to identity that a breakup is, where once you were, you know, you know, the most wanted person in the world, and now suddenly if you're rejected, you're deeply unwanted. And we tend to default to what I call your source fracture story, which is the original wounding in your heart. So breakups have broken us open to have a complete transformation at the level of identity and to begin to see how we have been duplicating old wounds in that relationship. And if you can really take responsibility for yourself as the source, you could even start to see how you almost set somebody up to fail you in the same ways. See, this is really the truth. This is the truth, and this truth is what does set us free. Because we can finally go back to that original story, that consciousness that we landed upon about who we are in relationship. And we can begin to challenge that part of us and recognize the deeper truth of ourselves as worthy, as powerful, as already deeply loved. And we can begin to mentor that younger self in our body so that he or she is no longer running the show. And we can start to show up in our power, in our, in our integrity, and in our authenticity in relationships. So those are the first three steps that are internal. The fourth and fifth is about how to create peace, how to generate cohesion, how to create healing, how to dissolve the resentments between you, how to set up structures where everyone gets to win moving forward, how to align your community on the new form of relationship. And so I wrote all of this down too. And when I wrote all of this down, Gwyneth Paltrow heard about it and she popped it into the lexicon. And the whole world suddenly knew about this new alternative to antagonistic, hostile divorce and it's divorce and it started a global conversation that didn't exist before I wrote it down and created conscious uncoupling. So how would a world leader of love and light order her morning coffee? About a year ago, I decided that it was time for me to call in the next one. And I felt a little insecure about it because, you know, I'm a little older and now I'm well known and I have, you know, a big life and who in the world could match me and I'm such a specialty item. You know, we all have all these reasons about why it's for other people and not for us. If I went through the room, I'd I'd hear your reason about why it's for other people and not for you. So I decided, though, to put one foot in front of the other, and my version of a vision board was to resurrect my singing career and to create an album called Lucky in Love. And I had the good fortune of uh, working with the Corrin brothers, who uh, our dear friend Monique Dubois, who's coming on the stage later, also works with. And there are these two Australian angel people who get up underneath 
um, singers and begin to collaborate with them and kind of uh, create musical magic. And so I shared with them that I had this vision of wanting to do this album as a form of weaving a new future into existence. And so they partnered with me, and I, I, I managed to write the breakup song, the forgiveness song, the getting into the consciousness of love song, the early stage of dating song. I even managed to write the, oh, I might be falling for you song. But what I couldn't write was the having of love song. I just was like frozen blocked, so it was getting procrastinated, and suddenly I needed to wash the kitchen floor like that. So I called up Isaac, one of the brothers. I said, I'm really stopped. And, and, and where I'm stopped is that I'm in a place of non-possibility. I'm, I'm feeling a little emotionally centered in resignation here. You know, even the queen of calling in the one needs support from her friends. We all need each other to hold the high watch for each other. So he talked to me for maybe about an hour. And at the end of the hour, it, it opened, the door opened, because he listened to all my story and all the past and all the reasons why. And he got it, he witnessed it, and then we went right into possibility together. So when I got off the phone, I was able to write this beautiful song of the having of love. And I just want to sing the first verse. I'm hoping I can sing right now. Sitting by the fire, on a Saturday night, reading David White by the flickering light, I look up and you're smiling. It's only been a year since the night that we wed, when we danced till dawn, then lay flowers in our bed, as the sun started rising. And then the lyric continues. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Could we grow roots like a tree, go as deep as the sea together? Could we expand like the sky and sail right on by bad weather? For once in my life, I can hear the music to my song. Everything's right as I listen to you sing along. Harmonize on and on. I love you. And so we went into the recording studio. And by the way, for those of you who don't know who David White is, He's a beautiful, prolific poet. So we went into the recording studio and we recorded it. We called the song, I Love You, which never felt quite right. But it was the only, it was like a, okay, well, I can't think of another name, so we'll call it I Love You. And a few weeks later, I met Michael. So another crazy, circuitous, shouldn't really happen this way, wasn't accept, expecting it, didn't see it coming, didn't try and make it happen, just showed up. And we fell deeply in love. Three weeks into our courtship, without knowing about this song, Michael sent me a David White poem. And so right now we're building our beautiful lives together. And of course, you know, I've grown myself richer and deeper and wiser because I'm always leaning into who I would need to become. And so the, what's possible in the relationship is a different kind of depth than I've ever experienced before. So the four things about how to manifest a miracle. Okay, four things. Number one, Stop boring God with your little tiny visions. Go for something that's completely impossible. Go for something that is bigger than you are and that you have no way of knowing how that could ever possibly happen because I think we inspire the angels when we do that. You unleash all sorts of synchronicity and magic when you do that. So start with a big, big, big vision. Put it out there, and if you want to have a lot of urgency in your life, put it in time. 
this shall be so. I'm going to make my first million dollars within one year. It's like, kind of like, go, you're on. And you see, because when you, when you put a big vision into the future, it, it almost begins to pull you into who you need to be, what you need to do. It begins to give you your actions and who you actually, and, and, and it informs you about the ways you need to grow and develop immediately with an urgency. Number two is you want to be living your life as though you are the source of it. Now, it's not like we're not victimized. We're victimized by a lot. It's a choice to live in a way where you see yourself as the source of everything. How am I the source of it? Don't get caught up in the negativity of victimization because you'll get stuck there. You want to always ask, how did I give my power away? What was my part in this? How might I reclaim my power? Sometimes not being victimized is just, well, who am I going to be in the face of this? Because there really wasn't anything that you did to create it. But it's the most powerful, creative way to live life. Creativity begins where victimization ends. There is no creativity in victimization. There is only reaction. There is not creation. The third thing, the most important thing, is you, can, you must align your vision with the self of your future fulfilled. We cannot receive into our lives that which is inconsistent with our identity to have. We absolutely can't. And if you look at your life, you're going to see that there are things that are easy for you to manifest. And, you'll, and, if you, and if you look at the identity you have in there, you're going to see that you, you kind of expect these things to come to you. You expect that you can make money or make friends or that your health is going to be good, that you're always going to have another job, you'll land on your feet. Some of you expect love and you get it. Maybe everyone in your family always had that thing. Maybe you were always told you were good at that particular thing. The things that we struggle with in life are those things that are outside of our identity to have. And when I talk about identity, what I'm really talking about is the self that you formed in response to the traumas that you went through. And it might be generational. You might inherit an identity from your mother's trauma or your grandmother's trauma or your grandfather's trauma. It works that way. So we don't have to resolve all the trauma in our lives before we can have what we desire. What we need to do is to stop identifying and being defined by that trauma and to awaken to who we actually are. Because the fulfillment of your vision is outside of that old story. And you want to start to define your life according to the future that you're committed to creating and not what you've endured in your past. And then the fourth thing is to awaken to yourself as a co-creator of that future fulfilled, to give up you know, praying for, hoping for, wishing for, waiting for someone to invite you, waiting to be noticed. You wanna to begin to generate that future inside of the actions you're taking, the choices that you're making. You want to start to hold yourself accountable for being who you'd need to be in order to fulfill upon that future and begin acting on it. And don't fall into the trap of thinking that psychological insight has anything to do with action. Psychological insight is great, but it's only the beginning of the journey. We have to make an effort to evolve ourselves beyond that story. So really, my message here today is just to tell you that the past doesn't define what's possible for you at all. It informs who you are today, but it doesn't define you. What actually defines you is the future that you're standing for creating. So be bold, be brave, take action in that direction, and let the magic begin. Thank you very much. Thank you.